Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining me in the 276th session of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Anthony Camilleri, better known as Tony, to friends and colleagues. And he is by far one of the nicest people you'll meet in the field of behavior analysis. In this episode, we talk about the lessons he's learned from implementing practical functional assessment and skills-based treatment. We also talk about his early experiences as a behavior analyst. We're both, I guess, Gen Xers, if you will. And so we you know, kind of shared some, some common experiences of working in behavior analysis way back when, when it was a fraction of the size that it is right now. Tony shares some really funny stories about working with Greg Hanley, and he worked with him way back in the day in Greg's first academic post out in Kansas. We talk about the development of FTF behavioral consulting and what that was like getting in on the ground floor of that entity and, again, consulting uh, basically across the world, working with individuals with severe challenging behavior using these strategies and techniques of skills-based treatment. We talk about the recent news of, of Tony's migration over to Action Behavior Centers and what opportunities lie ahead in that partnership. So if you're kind of a fan of that whole world, the SBT, PFA world, I think you'll find a lot of really interesting stories in this podcast episode. And again, we talk a lot about you know what he's learned in this process. And we one of the more interesting parts of this conversation is, you know, he talks about some of the common mistakes people make when implementing these strategies. And then towards the end of the podcast, we talk about his upcoming talk at the Stone Soup 2024 conference. And if you, by the way, if you want to attend that and you want to save a few bucks at registration, go to, uh, go to behavioralobservations.com, click on the show notes for this episode, and use the promo code PODCAST24 in, when, when you register and you'll be able to save a few bucks. But anyway, so we talk about his upcoming talk at Stone Soup. We get into these topics of, you know, compassionate approaches to ABA, trauma-informed ABA, and kind of what I've semi-kiddingly referred to as hyphenated ABA. And so we have some interesting dialogue over whether these terms are necessary or not. You know, we talk about, you know, whether it's appropriate to throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's towards the end of the show. And I would encourage you to stick around and listen to that, and you might get something out of that. So... And of course, there's a whole host of other things I, I'm not going to cover here in the introductory comments. You'll just have to tune into the episode to learn more about that. But it's a real fun conversation. Uh, again, the show notes will be your friends. So go to behavioralobservations.com and you can click on all the resources that we have there. It'll be there waiting for you. Before we get to the conversation itself, though, in addition to the Stone Soup Conference, are also brought to you by CEUs from yours truly, Behavioral Observations. Well, kind of yours truly, because really what you're doing is you're learning from some of your favorite podcast guests about some of the most important topics in behavior analysis. So if you want to get CEUs while you're commuting, while you're walking the dog, while you're at the gym, you know, if you want to solve that problem of making efficient use of your time, all while delving into, you know, all these rich conversations, go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash get CEUs. And we have lots of uh, discounts that are always available. So if you want to pick up more than a few, you can save really a lot of money. You know, the average, the average coupon value is almost a hundred bucks. So w- another way of saying that is when people purchase CEUs and leverage the power of the volume discounts, they can save a lot of money. We're also brought to you by the behavioraltoolbox.com. And we are so close to launching our third course And this one will be all about motivational interviewing. And it's the balls in my court to wrap it up. And I'm hoping to get that knocked out very soon. But yeah, we've got three. So pretty soon we'll have three courses ready for you. One on consulting, one on strategies to try in classroom settings before you request a functional assessment. And of course, this one on motivational interviewing. So lots in store. So go to thebehavioraltoolbox.com to learn more. And having said all that, I think that's it for opening remarks. So without any further delay, please enjoy this fun and really wide-ranging conversation with Dr. Tony Camilleri. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Dr. Tony Camilleri, welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing today? 
Oh, I'm doing quite well. Thanks, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the invitation, especially in conjunction with the upcoming Stone Soup Conference. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, well, we're getting the plugs right away. I like where this is going. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, we'll definitely talk about Stone Soup for sure. And I'm looking forward to seeing your talk there. And later on in the show, you'll get a chance to tell people what you're going to talk about but not tell all of it because we want people to go check out the Stone Soup Conference because it's a great event at a killer price, all serving a great cause. So appreciate that uh, foreshadowing of things to come. Um, <laughs> we got a lot, a, a ton of other things to get into as well, you know, in terms of, you know, what, what your career has been like, some exciting things that you've been doing as of late, some of the breaking news that you and your colleagues have made as of late and so forth. And again, we're going to get into all of that before. But first, let's start like we always do on behavioral observations. I'd like to know, Tony, you know, what, what was your first contact with behavior analysis? What made you uh, interested in it? What made you want to pursue it as a career? Hmm. Well, you know, I, I think I've had the fortune of being at the right place at the right time on many occasions. And, and I, I learned how to make the most of those opportunities. So... I can trace the history back to 1990 when I first went to college. And so that's quite a while ago now. (laughs) And I I went to Western New England College back when it was a college and not a university. The first semester I started off, or no, no, the first week or so I started off as a business major. And I said, oh, my goodness, no way, I can't do this. But I, I happened to be taking a course in psychology as well. And I was immediately impressed with the professors and the materials that they were using. I was exposed to the the Orange Miller book, the, the one that's a programmed instructional text, as well as the Green, Whaley, and Malott elementary principles book. And the stories that were told in those books were, you know, just enraptured me. And I said, that's that's cool. I want to be able to do that. At the end of the time, though, there was not much you could do with a psychology degree after college other than go on for more school. And uh, so I asked, I asked Hank Schlinger, I said, hey, where sh- what do I do next? And he, he said, I think you should go to UNT, the University of North Texas. And I said, sure, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> he was quite familiar with the folks down there and the, and the program that they were running. So. I packed my bags and went down to Texas and worked on a master's degree. I was curious, because we're about the same age here, I had the same experience of trying to figure out where to go to graduate school at the end of my undergraduate tenure. Did you did you happen to have that 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 thin green book that had like all all the behavior analysis programs in the country? And oh, it was yes. about it was about like maybe <laughs> maybe three eighths of an inch thick. And yeah. it was it was a green soft cover book, eight and a half by eleven, and it basically had like Western Michigan, Kansas, Florida, Florida State, Auburn, you know, West Virginia, West Virginia, UC, and, and and that was like you know like you could almost count them on on both hands. It was <laughs> it was really kind of funny. So yeah. anyway, that's ancient ancient history for most of the listeners of this show. But I was just curious if that was a if that was a an experience that you shared as well. So all right, so. That that little uh, piece of trivia, behavior analytic trivia, not aside, you get the advice from Hank to go to UNT, and you, yeah, uh, not so you, well. You com- I was there. You, you comply. <laughs> I complied. Yes, <laughs> I was being a good a good boy, good student. <laughs> and he hadn't steered me wrong previously. I, I was very grateful for his mentorship, as, along with Dennis Kolejski, who uh, actually is still at West New England. But anyway, UNT was a fabulous place. It was so vibrant. The year I arrived was the year that Jesus Rosales arrived, along with uh, Shala Alai and Rick Smith. And they they were joining already well-seasoned behavior analysts. In fact, there were the the the, the department at the time was a, a vibrant place where we just would go, we would study, we would hang out, we would visit with the, the professors. They they had so much time that they were able to give to us and mentor outside of the classroom as well as inside the classroom. So 
you know, three years later, I said, okay, what do I do next? And I, I talked to Shell and Jesus, and, and they recommended going where they finished their degrees at the University of Kansas. And that was amazing. It was an amazing time. I went and had a chance to, to learn from Mott Wolf and Don Baer, and my advisor, Don Bouchel. And it was uh, an exciting time. <laughs> Right there towards the end, it was Greg's first year as a professor at the University of Kansas. It was my last year as a student. And we're also very similar in age. So we overlapped by by a whole year. And he was gracious enough to invite me into his lab. And I got a chance to sit in there and be part of the work that he was doing in early education, where the preschool life skills came out, and a whole host of other projects that we worked on. We were very productive in that year. But then I had to leave for my first big boy job, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I didn't get a chance to see him that often. But we stayed in touch primarily because we ha- had a lot of manuscripts in the in the works, so uh, we needed to work on those remotely. Before before we leave Kansas for, and I want to hear what your big boy job is. But did you have a sense of knowing how? unique enough of an opportunity it was to be at Kansas at that time. I'd sometimes wonder when you're in the environment, you may maybe not necessarily realize those things in the moment. And only upon reflection, you're like, Oh my gosh, I was, you know, in this milieu with the greats as it were. Did that dawn on you? At, did you realize what was going on at the time or, or was that something that, that you've come to appreciate more deeply, you know, years later? I'm just curious what that was like. I was star starstruck. For sure. When I got up there, I was reading everything I could get my hands on from the from many of the professors. But they put you at ease right away. Everybody called everybody by their first name. And it was colleague, junior colleague, mentorship model. So they they actively put you at ease and made you feel comfortable, gave you opportunities, and shaped along the way in a in a way that I felt was was gentle and appropriately paced. Okay. So, yeah, it was great. Now, I'll tell you a little quick sidebar story. Um, <laughs> so Greg's lab, I believe Greg's lab was in the morning on Tuesdays. And I loved going to that. We would we would go and, you know, review all of the research and the projects and see what questions we're answering and what questions remain. And then on Friday afternoon, Friday afternoons at KU was really something special. Because from about noon until 2.30, about two and a half hours, I was at the Bear Bouchelle Research Lab every week. And it was just amazing to see the, these two think and operate and the stories they would tell. When that would be, when that, the whole lab would get up and we'd go downstairs for our weekly pro seminar. So uh, we would have sometimes an invited speaker or sometimes a member of the faculty or sometimes a student who's uh, getting ready to defend might present some of their research. And we would we would stay there for another hour and a half or so being educated. And then the conversations would start as we spill out into the parking lot, make our way to the cars, keep on having those conversations when we meet up downtown in Lawrence at the Free State Brewery. And and it's there where we would stay for you know a good a good portion of the evening have an dinner undeter- an undetermined amount of time <laughs> an undetermined amount of time unless there was a Jayhawk game that we had to get to and if that was the case we would sometimes have to truncate those conversations and, and so I interrupted you were about to tell me about you know your first big job and yeah so if you want to just keep going I'm just curious where your <laughs> kind of career arc took you from from Kansas oh, yeah. forward well then so. Uh, f- uh, f- friend and student at Kansas left a couple years ahead of me to start a dissemination site of the Princeton Child Development Institute. His name's Kevin Brothers. And he he founded the Somerset Hills Learning Institute. And he needed some he needed a behavior analyst and I knew him quite well. So and we had a lot in common. So he sent me where he said, come on over once you graduate and we'll give you a job and have some fun together while while we work. And that went real great until I got an invitation to come down and interview for a job leading the Jane Justin School in Fort Worth, Texas. My good friend Dwee Lee invited me to come down and and together we worked for about 10 years building 
people and the behavior analysis department. And it became a thriving place. And it still is to this day. And I still stay in touch with the folks that are over there. But eventually, I needed to come back to the East Coast to be closer to family and access some some educational opportunities for my own kids that weren't available in Texas. So I, you know, packed up and came here. And so now I find myself living about 20 minutes from Greg again. And, you know, we rekindle and stayed in touch. At the time I was directing, I was the CEO of a local school and for kids with special needs. And he was still a professor at the University of, uh, no, Western New England University. And at that point, he had had enough, of, I think, of the university life. And I had had enough of <laughs> the, the the work that was done and needed for a person in a CEO position. And he invited me to come work for him. And I said, yeah, sure, let's do it. When do I start? And I felt great to be part of the FTF project on the ground floor. Just a couple of weeks ago, I, you know, opened up the Facebooks and I'm like, holy cow, there's like you and Greg and others that are, you know, it's like, well, there's a lot of things changing here. And funny enough, like I must have gotten at least five various messages from people asking me what was going on at FTF. Like, (laughs) Like we're all roommates on some sitcom or something like that, you know. Like, I, I was, and you know, like, and so it was really kind of funny. It's like I, I don't know, you know. I, I think I had uh, texted Greg, you know, a, t- a congratulatory note, but I didn't really know much about it. So, so I'm going to stop kind of hinting around here. And so, for those who have no idea what what we're talking about here, <laughs> tell me about this, this, re- these recent announcements that that have been made, and there's some transitions and things like that that are that are happening. Yeah. So, yeah. It, Fill in the blanks and take as much time as you need because FTF has become, <laughs> as a, I, I think, a special place in terms of, you know, what what a lot of practitioners will aspire to as it relates to their own assessment treatment uh, capabilities. I know tons and tons of people who have taken the courses, and of course, it's been fun to see the development of this whole technology from the you know kind of 2014 paper on. Mm-hmm. So, I, so I think, yeah. uh, you know, I think there's a lot of interest more, more generally in the field about what you guys are up to for. <laughs> so yeah oh my gosh I, i'm sure i'll be happy to talk about the big announcement but leading up to that let me just say that the, the working at ftf was just a, an amazing opportunity and you know greg asked me in, in the beginning when he said do you want to do you want to do this and he said are you sure and i said yeah i'm absolutely sure good things always happen when i'm around you and and he, he said oh thank you i appreciate that and it was a fantastic time because he still had a lot of students who were getting ready to graduate. They were defending their their review papers. They were defending their dissertations. They were submitting those things off to the journals, and it was it was quite busy. And we felt like we were on the cutting edge of all all things PFA and SBT. The also we all got along. We all get along tremendously well together. We support each other. We we uh, practice. Listening to understand rather than listening to respond. And and we are not afraid of hard work and long hours. We do those sorts of things because we know that either we're going to help make their life a little bit better or in turn, we're, there's going to be someone down the line whose life will be made better. And Greg, of course, has an infectious personality. He's got great drive, ambition. He expects a lot out of us. And we we do our best to try to rise to the occasion. So as the organization was growing and we started taking on more clients, we happened upon a client that reached out that was that is named Action Behavior Centers. And we started providing consultation services to them over it's over a year now. And we put eight cohorts through the consultation process. Each cohort has serves three students. And it generates a lead implementer and two support implementers. So by most standards, that's a big accomplishment in, in you know, a year, year and a half or so to get that many cohorts going. But Action Behavior Centers is, is a large organization, and they have about 13,000 
employees. And they liked the process so well and the outcomes it was producing and the social validation that went along with it that they said, we need to think a little bit outside the box how we can scale this, how we can scale our capacity in a more expeditious way. So so one day, they their CEO called up Greg. Their CEO, by the way, his name is Hirsch, and he's he shares our values. He shares our, our values and our desire to help people. So there's already a really nice connection there. And he, so, so he had the conversation with Greg, made an offer. Greg came back to the leadership team and said, we were approached. We were asked to do this. Before you say anything, let me go through the pros and the cons of the way he saw it. And, you know, so s- some of the pros were, that we have an opportunity to scale at a pace that's unparalleled in disseminating PFA and SBT. We have an opportunity to do some research on the process to get even more information out into the public domain. So those are two very attractive pieces. On the downside, it's going to require a little bit more travel for me and Nasheed. (laughs) Greg is already a traveler that, you know, he's, he's out and about every month. So we had to consider that, and and we also had to consider what kind of what would that do to FTF. We we don't want to leave it, you know, in the in the dust. It's a it's our baby. We created it together and nursed it, and it's it's doing you know quite well. So we said we would only do it if we all agreed to do it, and if we can do it in such a way that preserves the the, the prominent place that FTF holds in the community. So that involved a couple of moves. One was to see if Kelsey would take over executive director role in to manage the day-to-day operations, the stuff that Greg would often take care of. And so not only is she a fantastic clinician, but she's also a quite savvy businesswoman. And 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 she's fantastic with organization. So I'm already impressed to see the transition that she's making. Greg's going to retain ownership of the company, but he's going to be an employee of of Action Behavior Centers along with Mashid and I. So the question was then, all right, what do we do? We have all these clients that are lined up and we we want to make a smooth transition. We don't want to say no to anybody. So if fortune, you know, the people are just show up at the right time at the right places sometimes there's a lot of fortunate accidents that happen and it just so happened that holly and ditto were available and wanted to become part of ftf again they they holly was a full-time employee and sure. ditto was a part-time employee for a period of time but they they wanted a change and it and an opportunity presented itself almost perfectly in line with the transition that we were talking about. So it all coalesced, and uh, I feel very comfortable with the decision. FTF is going to continue to thrive and provide services like it has. It's going to continue to credential the practitioners of PFA and SBT to to offer up a, a, a bit of consumer protection that's out there that or that's needed to be out there. And uh, we're going to go over to ABC. And the plan is that Mashid and I will probably be going down two weeks or going to a center anyway, on a Thursday and Friday, two weeks out of every month. So let's say we have the beginning of a month, let's say October. Greg would go out on a Thursday and Friday, deliver his two-day lecture. Then Mashid and I would go out. And on the Thursday, we would we would meet with our, our individual teams and go over, do a design session with them. Then on Friday, we would run the ISCAs and move into treatment. We'd come back the following week, do the same thing with another group. And then we remote support them for the remainder of that month and, and onward until they complete the whole package. Meanwhile, each month we're adding another set of centers into the mix so that at a certain point, our, our first goal is to get a level six trained person in every center, every ABC center in the country. 
Okay, so for people who aren't familiar with the the certification vernacular, can you just give us a brief, well, what does level six mean? Oh, sure, yes. Level six means that you've been trained in PFA and SBT to the point that you can now supervise others and help others facilitate meaningful outcomes at a, at a distance. So the first part of certification, a level one and level two, level one is about education. You take the education, either attending a work, a live workshop or you take the on-demand course, you get level one certified. Level two involves application in the sense that you, you design a PFA and, and a skill-based treatment plan. Okay, now you're at level two. Levels three and four are about support implementers and lead implementers. It's about where the rubber hits the road. You have to be able to demonstrate that you can do the process. And while upholding the values of safety, dignity, televisability, and steady, peaceful progress. And then from there, uh, level five is about generalization and doing a few more design sessions. Level six is the supervisory credential. There is actually a level seven. <laughs> that is that enlightenment, you know? Or <laughs> what's that? Complete enlightenment. A complete enlightenment. Yes, when you've reached enlightenment, the bottom, you get to the top <laughs> of the mountain. <laughs> That's right, or the top of the tree, I guess, to be a brand, you know, to be on brand of, with with the uh, <laughs> with, with the cabs, right? So yeah, the level sevens are reserved for for the FTF people. You know, it's 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 a consultation credential at that point, and we're going to retain our level sevens because Meshi nine Greg, because we're going to still be attending the weekly clinical meeting that FTF holds so that we can be continue to be on the cutting edge of latest process development and we can actually feed back some information about about application that might be useful for you know the the broader team. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying the conversation with Tony so far. I want to take a quick break and just remind you that if you need CEUs Go on over to behavioralobservations.com forward slash get CEUs. And I am on that page right now. And I just counted them all up. And there are 64 CEU events available for you. And uh, boy, that snuck up on me. I didn't know that we had that many, but we do. And so if you bought CEUs a while ago and you think that, oh, there's nothing new. Well, there's a lot of new events and across a lot of really interesting topics. I've really been trying to focus on including more supervision and ethics CEUs as well, because I know those, you know, it's really hard to find quality CEU events on those topics. So I've been trying to feature those as well. But we've got CEUs on all sorts of other topics like functional assessment, motivational interview, interviewing, acceptance and commitment therapy, AAC, verbal behavior, trauma, and a whole host of other things. So go over to behavioralobservations.com and click on the CEUs page. One last thing I'll point out to you before we get back to the conversation is that if you need a bunch of CEUs, there are two tiers of volume discounts that you can avail yourself to. So if you need a lot of CEUs, and there's no judgment here, I've been in a bind before and need to scramble to get all my CEUs, you can you can get up to 50% off using the code bundle at checkout. And then if you only need a couple, uh, you can, but you know, more than one or two, you can use the coupon code 30 to save 30%. So there are various ways to save some money. And, oh, I guess one other thing I'll say is that getting your CEUs in this format solves a problem. And it solves the problem of, you know, making use of time that you, you know, that you're already doing other things with. So if you're commuting, you're walking the dog, you're at the gym, you just put your earbuds in, listen to a podcast, go take a quiz so we can document that you're actually there, and then that's it. It's really straightforward. So again, if you are looking to uh, brush up on some topics, if you're looking to round out your CEUs for your certification cycle, head on over to behavioralobservation.com forward slash get CEUs. All this stuff helps keep the podcast going. So I appreciate each and every one of you who support the show in this way. All right. That's it about CEUs from Behavioral Observations. So let's get back to this conversation with Tony. Are you guys, so it sounds like you have a really full plate. So I'm kind of even blushing to ask this question, but 
I have to imagine this opportunity also provides the chance to ask some interesting experimental questions. Is research on applied research on the table here with this, with, you know, these new opportunities, especially having the opportunity to practice at the scale that seems like what might come from the situation that you've described? Oh, yes, for sure. Research is a big uh, reason why it was attractive to the three of us. We want to contribute to, we want to continue contributing to the research base, especially when it's about this process. And, and uh, ABC has demonstrated a commitment to research. So the, the news that happened just slightly before our news that was rattling around the internet uh, was that they hired Dr. Linda LeBlanc to be their, I think, vice president of research. I think that's the title that they gave her. So for us to have an opportunity to work with Linda and for Linda to help set up research protocols along with me, Mashid, and and Greg, my goodness, unprecedented opportunity here to, to do something pretty special on a large scale. Yeah, you got two former editor-in-chiefs of Java, so it's, <laughs> uh, it's just a little bit of uh, expertise there, I suppose. That's cool. That's really fun. Uh, yeah. So I know we're talking about kind of forward-looking things here. I want to maybe put the car in reverse for a minute and again, go back. One of the, what, what was, do you recall when you first kind of learned about the, this ISCA PFA process? Yeah. Uh, you know, what was, what was your conception of, you know, I guess isolated versus synthesized contingencies or, you know, there's probably a number of different ways to tack that, but you yeah. know, you know, when this was first laid out to you, and I don't know if it was done so, you know, prior to the 2014, you said you kept in touch with Greg over the years. I don't know if this, this, you know, if you got an early preview of this, this type of approach, but I'm curious how you responded to it. Were you skeptical of it? Or is like, oh my gosh, I've just been seeing this in practice for years. It makes so much sense. And you were all in or, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, you can give us a little bit of story there. I, I'd be curious to hear that experience. Sure. Yeah. I, I think I would trace it all the way back to the the Hanley 2012 myths paper. Ah, yes. Right. I like that paper so much. And I think it prepared me for the 2014 paper. <laughs> I, I'm laughing because I cited that paper. I spent a few minutes talking about that paper at my, I, I recently presented New Hampshire ABBA last weekend. And I, I actually talked about that paper. I saw as, some as great action I, shots of you out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I kind of like, when I saw some, I felt like, what was the guy from Wolf of Wall Street at the end? He's like, sell me this pencil. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm do a sales seminar. But anyway, that's neither here or there. But, so uh, you, you're saying you cited you cited? Yeah, I spent a few talk? minutes talking about it. And then I spent a few minutes talking about the, the response paper from Anderson to St. Peter. And I, I said, if you're practicing in schools, both of these papers are required reading. And then anyway, so, so anyway, I... I that's why I started laughing when you mentioned that paper. So you, you read the 2012 <laughs> yeah. paper. And- yeah, the 2012 paper sort of put me at ease and prepared me for what was to come because I had been growing d- dissatisfied, w- struggling with with trying to use what was what we might call a, a standard functional analysis or an isolated functional ana- contingency, contingency functional analysis. I was struggling to make sense of it. Oftentimes, my graphs look like a bowl of spaghetti, and and they were they were effortful to run. They were hard to run. They they didn't appear to be. They didn't have that face validity. They looked a little unsafe, and they weren't leading to considerably different treatment outcomes. So i I was feeling frustrated, and I was primed for something new. Now, as a scientist practitioner, it's always good to be a little skeptical and not just, you know, gobble up the newest thing on on the block. But, you know, the new thing does garner attention and uh, it's right for us to look at as skeptics, anything new to be skeptical. You know, a one shot demonstration does, you know, isn't enough for a lay it out in a moment is that PFA SBT is indeed more than meets the American Psycholo- Psychological Association's definition of evidence-based practice. So, so when I read the paper, I said, "Oh, interesting. This is great. Okay, well, we actually got three replications within the same paper. 
well, two replications, the first demonstration and then two others with two other subjects. And I, it made sense. I, I love the ecological validity associated with it. I love the idea of uh, combining different reinforcement contingencies instead of breaking the world down into unnatural pieces. So I, I guess maybe let me just take a little step back to say I'm very grateful for the isolated functional analysis work that had been done. It, it represented a major shift in our field for which everyone should be proud at that time because it, it encouraged professional humility. It said it made us think, I am committed, committed to assessing problem behavior before and trying to understand it to at least some extent before I, tr- I attempt to treat it. So I, th- I thought that was a, a big step forward for the field. Now, of course, there's been debates, and I don't really participate in those very much anymore. I think the the, the question has been asked, asked and answered many times. So just in brief, the, the isolated contingency approach represented a big change, a big shift in the field, but we got too hyper-focused on singular functions. And those FAs were not safe, oftentimes not safe, not televisable, and didn't lead to reliable improvements in treatment. By contrast, the PFA, SPT process, the PFA, the synthesized contingency analysis, r- reliably leads to uh, the identification of what evokes the problem behavior, what turns off the problem behavior in a in a in a way that is so personalized that it 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 needs you have to get into the the weeds to figure it out it's not just attention it's not just tangibles it's not just escape it's like attention what kind of attention are we talking manned compliance are we talking are we talking having people narrate stories with you or participate in a particular in a particular way those are the things when you don't have that kind of nuance in in the isolated version. So I love the the richness that can come from from a synthesized contingency analysis, and they reliably lead to to treatment that is effective. Yeah, I will. I will say I I think there. You know, when one of the first conversations I had with Greg, he said, you know, a lot of this stuff has been, you know, kind of hiding in the literature for for decades prior to the i guess full articulation of this this i you know synthesized conceptualization yeah. function that this research group has you know really went to town on over the last i guess decade or so but the uh you know the there's w- one of those papers is probably one of my, my shortest and f- most you know one of my most favorite java papers and it's like you know just a ha- couple of pages long is a it's i think it's a Piazza Fisher and you know some number of colleagues. I think it was back in like ninety six or ninety seven in, in Java, and it was blanking on the exact title. But they, it was on the differing types of attention, yeah. uh, you know, and it, they tested different types of of, of attention based responses, tone, content, etc. And they yeah. saw differentiation based off of that. So that was kind of one yeah. of the cool early, early studies that, that, that show that, yeah, it's not just this blanket form of attention. Don't do that or please stop. And you know, yeah, they, they, stop, they you could, hurt yourself. There's some sensitivity based off of the individual experiences, which, you know, looking backwards, right. we should all be like, well, of course. And then yeah. I, I want to backtrack just a little bit lo- more too. And just for folks, you know, we're, we're you know, we kind of, I want to make sure the, uh, we don't, leave any audience members behind that 2012 myths paper. It's a behavior analysis and practice paper. I will put a link to that in the show notes and just the cliff notes version of this. And Tony, please correct me if I mischaracterize this is, but basically this is pre ISCA, but the idea is that the, the, the spirit of the paper was to be analytic mm-hmm. and not to forego experimental manipulations and believe that the, the, the gist of the paper was walking through various versions of of the of, of functional analytic methodologies like precursors precursor fas trial based fas and you know brief fas and things like that that had been around the literature for some periods of time and so the idea that a you know an fa is something that just people just do at kennedy krieger 
you know, or is, you know, should, should be abandoned. So did I, did I characterize that in the broad strokes correctly? In broad strokes, for sure. Absolutely. I I think maybe the only thing I would add to that would be that I think Greg was trying to convey there's no more excuses for not being analytic. Mm -hmm. He's blasting away the myths, blasting away the supposed barriers and saying, Here's how you do it, my friends, and pointing to examples in the in the history, which I always love about him. He's he's such a, a humble guy, and he he's always quick to point out that yeah, what we're doing here is maybe a, a new combination of stuff that has already been researched in the literature, and and he gives the credit to those to those historical writings and practices. As as he is now conceptualizing, I think taking things to a level that is, you know, really unprecedented. Yeah, and he tell I think he talks about that paper specifically in I believe session one of behavioral observations. So I'll put a link to that in the, in the show notes as well. Yeah, and for folks, if you want to get the show notes, uh, go to behavioralobservations.com and sign up for the email list, and I'll send the show notes directly to your inbox. Mm-hmm. So just a little plug for the mailing list there. Yeah, I love it. You know, here's a, an interesting little fact that so if we if we identify, you know, 2012 or 2014 as, you know, the first publications where it's this is sort of coming together a little bit more so than piecemeal. Nowadays at last count, there's 36 studies that have been that have evaluated important parts of the PFA SBT process. That's that's a nice growing number. But more important is that social were demonstrated with PFA and SBT, not just in that 2014 study, but socially valid outcomes have been replicated across 16 studies from 11 different research groups in five different countries. So that's what I was referring to as meeting the definition, more than meeting the definition of an evidence-based practice according to the American Psychological Association. Regardless of your title, if you are a behavior consultant who is working in or with schools and you are struggling and wondering why your interventions are not producing the desired results, you are not alone. Unfortunately, those tasked with improving behavior in schools are too often left to carry the burden by themselves. You are the behavior person, so you take care of it, is the unsaid mantra. But you can't improve behavior and the associated outcomes by yourself. In fact, Creating sustainable improvement in student behavior almost always requires changes in the performance of the educators. I'm Dr. Pauly, and along with my colleagues Anika Costa and Matt Sicoria, we are designing coursework called the Behavioral Toolbox. In it, you will be taught strategies grounded in organizational behavior management for consulting in schools in a way that brings out the best in educators so they can bring out the best in the students they serve. If this sounds exciting, be sure to click on the link in the description to sign up for more information. Given that you've been right there through all of this stuff and you've done tons and tons of consultation and supported people you know, all over the place and seen these processes play out in innumerable ways, what are some, you know, what are some ways in which the process has maybe evolved uh, mm-hmm. o- over the years, based on you know that might be different than when it was you know the right on yeah we're based still treatment learning. Is, is you know as first described you know years ago. Huh? I think the let's start at the beginning. We'll start at the start with changes in the analysis. Right, the the analysis was uh, originally put together as other like other analyses had been. They were run in sessions. It was a, it was a time based functional analysis. So we ran five-minute sessions or 10-minute sessions. Tens were a little long. Five seemed to be the sweet spot. Test, control, test, test, control. And the let's say you know we're in the test. Well, the, the, the EO is scheduled to come every 30 seconds regardless of what the student's behavior was like. And that was a carryover from previous functional analysis analytic methods. Right? Regardless of what the student is doing, the EO is scheduled and bam, bam, bam. It keeps coming every every 30 seconds. The big change in the ISCA was uh, right around the time that, that FTF was forming, we decided to move it from 
from a time-based analysis to a performance-based analysis. So no longer did we have these little mini sessions of test control. We had one session where we had a reinforcement context and we had an evocative context and we would only move into the evocative context for the first EO after five minutes of the child being happy, relaxed, and engaged. And then subsequent impositions of the EO would only come after at least 30 seconds of regaining happy, relaxed, and engaged from the previous EO. It brought the heat down even more. You know, we were already looking at, you know, R2 behavior, mild, mild problem behavior. We're already synthesizing. But this change, I, I think, was a hugely important. In, in one of our training videos, there, there's a, a video of a student who had just had enough. He basically was telling the implementer, your EOs are coming too fast, and I've already told you this once. And he was getting frustrated. And I think that's the moment Greg pointed to. I was sitting saying, all right, we got to do something different. But that's one of the things I really admire about him because he's using, he's using practice to make decisions, you know, in the moment. And I, I can't help but admire that kind of reflection and desire to keep getting better. I see. And so, again, based on your considerable body of work in this area, when you're seeing people implement, are yeah. there common challenges that they encounter? Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, what people do about those challenges or problems or mistakes or what have you. So yeah. I'm curious yeah, to hear your thoughts sure. on that. The biggest one... I hear about sometimes after the fact or after we get called in because someone attempted to run SBT and it didn't go well. And, you know, on some occasions I've learned, oh, they, they went right to the analysis. They didn't do, I'm sorry, they went right to treatment. They didn't do an analysis. So that was a, that's the first thing we have to, you don't see that that much anymore because people are understanding, okay, this is an efficient process. We can get the answers we need in a relatively short amount of time. But yes, first and foremost, not running the analysis is a is a big problem. That's a com that's a mistake. It's becoming less common, thankfully. Another one is not following the client's lead in the synthesized reinforcement context. Some people have a hard time zipping it <laughs> and following just following the lead. Sometimes the student is quiet and playing, and the you know we want the implementer to be available to them. But we, but we want them to follow the lead. We don't want them to ask questions unless the student indicates that they want questions being asked of them. And we, we don't narrate their play. We, we're just there. We're available. So those, those folks who are dropping mini EOs inside of the reinforcement context, un, un, perhaps unintendedly, may, may, may be leading to a lack of had being happy, relaxed, and engaged in that student. So that's a common mistake. Another one is not personalizing the synthesis adequately, relying too much on the stuff or the tangibles and not enough on the unique social interactions that they might prefer. <laughs> Can you think of an example where, you know, there was a very unique social interaction that someone missed? I know I'm totally putting oh, yeah. you on the spot here, so we can come back to it or, 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 <laughs> skip it all together. But I, I I hear some of these stories that's like, oh, I didn't know until X and I saw mom do Y or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this was, I'll give you a good example. This girl, I was on live on site up in Michigan to coach an analysis. And this this girl was, she loved man compliance. Ooh. <laughs> That was that was her deal. If she could control you guys or, or everybody in the room just so, she was in heaven, she giggly, happy. It tickled her to no end. So we had a couple of people running that analysis, and and she would she would tell them sing or play church. You could start to get an idea of what her life was like. She'd say play church, and they would play like the organ and. The girl would say, yeah, more organ. And and then she'd say, sing. And the and the, now the implementers are playing the organ and singing. Then she would switch and she'd say, Be be like Annie, who's our little baby sister, who was just born a couple of weeks ago. 
And so now they, they go and they pretend that they're little baby, the, the little baby. And, and then she'll say, throw up. <laughs> and they have to pretend to throw up, just like our little sister does quite often when she's nursing. You know, you can't get that from a, the only way you can get that kind of information is from an open-ended interview that allows for us to dig in and get qualitatively rich information. You can't find that sort of thing. And, you know, an assessment tool where it's just binary. Do, do they like attention? Do they not like attention? Yeah. <laughs> the att- what forms of attention matters tremendously. And man compliance has been in the literature since 1990 or so. Rachel Thompson, I, was, I think she's the lead author on, on it. It doesn't get referenced very often, but it's a powerful contingency. If you know how to harness it properly, you can leverage it to to teach some some uh, the skills of communication, toleration, and cooperation. Now, now, should I infer that when that this in, this this individual, when people did not respond to her request to do X, Y, and Z, that that's when problem behavior occurred? That's right, exactly. So once we got the FCR, so what we would do is we would we would stop doing what she's asking, and she would say excuse me, can I have my way, please? And initially, the, the implementers would say, yes, of course you can. And they go right back to complying with all of her all of her mands. Of course, the rate of manding for that is going up through the roof now, and we can't live there, so we need to move on to the next step, which is toleration. So then we introduce, she'll say, can I have my way, please? And they'll say, no, sorry, not this time. Fist bump. A little fist bump, a little explicit acknowledgement of, okay, I'm cool with that. And as soon as you make contact, you say, you know what? Let's go back to your way. Absolutely. So you reinforce that little bit of tolerance. Then, of course, you you she's already relinquished the the game, so to speak, right? So you would move into cap two, which would be to get her to transition from the table where they're having these wonderful conversations over to a table of high expectations where she'd have to do her work. And now we're, we're uh, stretching that amount of time, the, the delay before she gets back to doing things her way. Eventually, she'll be out at the table, not just transitioning, but doing contextually appropriate work while she's waiting to get back to having things her way that includes man, man compliance. That's a very, very illustrative story there so uh, <laughs> definitely definitely can picture that very very easily i could continue asking questions about your your consultation experiences because i'm sure you have a gazillion stories like that but what i do want to get back to is the stone soup conference you've got a talk coming up oh, yeah. uh, compa- compassion over compliance exploring a contemporary compassion and trauma sensitive form of aba mm-hmm. so what is the you know what's the purpose of this talk what 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 problem or you were trying to solve by putting it together or what message are you trying to share with the audience this is a, a more of a general a general message about how the the process of pfa and spt is generally applicable it's a it's it's an introduction really to the process it's it's just an hour long so we're not going to be able to get too deep into the weeds but I do plan on taking a little bit of time at the beginning to talk about how problem behavior is often a historical accident of learning. I have a video to demonstrate that, which uh, is actually a little on the funny side. It involves my own kids. <laughs> I see. So I'm going to give that away. Uh, I'm okay. giving that away at the moment. I was just happened to catch this video early on. And then I'll take them into a little bit of an exercise envisioning other examples of how problem behavior can be a historical accident of learning. The seeds of it can be a historical accident of learning. And once it makes contact with reinforcement contingencies, it can continue to get shaped into something that is, you know, a real problem. I'm going to talk about why some of the reasons or why problem behavior tends to persist. I'll talk about our shared values of dignity, of safety, dignity, televisability, and making steady, peaceful progress. I'm going to talk about the leveraging of synthesized reinforcement contingencies to uh, teach the skills of 
communication, toleration, and cooperation. And then finally, I'm going to talk about two different types of problem behavior, serious problem behavior and mild problem behavior, and how to respond differentially to both of them. That's one of the the, the biggest things that it's the most nuanced part of SBT is knowing, knowing when to reinforce and, and when to encourage persistence with empathy and support. Making that discrimination is is the most nuanced part of SBT. It's sometimes it's what we talk about most often in our consultation. Do you live to teach another day? Do you persist on? And there's this wonderful tension that I feel in my stomach. I always have whenever I'm doing shaping, because you you're asking yourself that question: Do I do I hold, do I reinforce right now and get what capture that that behavior right there? Or do I risk having the things fall apart and then get into a, you know an escalation or something like that? It's that it's a tension between the two. And I'm sure you know many people feel it. But the more you practice, it's like it's like any skill. The more you practice, the the better you're gonna get at it, the 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 sharper your skills will be, and you'll you'll become sensitive to these minor changes in your patient or client that previously may have gone completely missed. I see. So I'm going to get into a topic here that I, I see. I guess it's you know, kind of a, a piggybacking off the, the, the title of your talk here. You know, the, the word compassion is in the, in the title not only once but twice. So <laughs> you know, I guess paying off that, you know, I, I, and you know, I do see these terms like compassionate care, trauma-informed care, trauma-sensitive, and so forth, you know, becoming increasingly common. And, uh, and to be clear, I'm not arguing that we should not attend to these sorts of things, but I sometimes worry that using these terms with such, you know, such frequency, it almost kind of blends into the background, uh, if you will. I also... Sometimes in the course, maybe I'm reading into too much of what I see t- in terms of the online discourse, but you know, I do worry about you know people perhaps inadvertently coming away with with overly rigid rules about practice because what you just described is you know kind of the, the judicious use of extinguishing lower level problem behavior in service of you know mm-hmm. reinforcing continued cooperation or we can even call it compliance in the in the in the, in the technical sense. In serve in, in service of of you know developing you know more I guess socially valid repertoires reduction of problem behavior the you know uh, accomplishing larger things more generally speaking and, and and I also and I'm not hearing you make this argument so don't get me wrong but but with the with the 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 you know I another potential thing and again I don't know if I'm just being paranoid or you know maybe inappropriately concerned about this sort of thing. But there's almost a an implication sometimes that the behavior analysis was not compassionate or or empathetic and things like that. And certainly we can point to specific examples where that that, that was the case. But you know, Bill Hearn at the New England Center does does a great talk on this. He gave the keynote to FABA last year, you know, talking about you know the roots of behavior analysis and and you know how that the you know these things have been talked about for quite some time and. You know, Tim Vollmer uh, on on this podcast a few months ago talked about how sometimes using using you know the escape extinction during feeding protocols can can very quickly and still socially validly help with you know remedi almost instantly re- remediate feeding problems. And again, I would encourage people to go back and take his word for it, not mine. I'm, I may not be recalling the specific verbiage. <laughs> correctly but he made a case for like hey you know what like let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. essentially mm-hmm. again my words not his so i don't know am i rigging my hands too much over this stuff am i am i you know am i sounding like an old crank or like the uh the old guys in the balcony uh <laughs> in the muppets or something like that no i, I, I don't know i i, I don't I, some, think so. I, I, I go back and forth with this because yeah we need to Put tools in practitioners' hands that are more effective that people are going to be able to look at and and be proud of, and you know, no one, no one feels good about, you know, when when things go south with an individual. Let's say someone's in the situation that you just described, where they're kind of on that edge of of of, of pushing or not pushing. I think a lot of us have been in a situation where maybe we didn't quit while we were ahead, 
and had a yep. meltdown on our hands, right? No one feels good about that, right? Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot of validity to your point and what you're saying and things like that. And so I, I kind of go back and forth across these different <laughs> perspectives here. Well, well, first of all, the I'm grateful to you. You're the fact that something is not quite sitting perfectly well with you means that, and and because you're deriving some of that from discourse that's happening in in other venues, you're the voice of thousands of people, and and you you provide a tremendously valuable service. So to have the opportunity to talk about that and to validate. Yeah, there's some concern, and perhaps in other situations, maybe it's it's maybe it's a little exaggerated. But I love it that you're being the voice of of so many important people out there that that are struggling to understand, and they have these conflicting <laughs> directions, so to speak. I think we can find the middle ground, and if we if and we don't have to work that hard. But I'm going to try to do it with a couple of examples. Perfect. Tim's right. You don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Okay. That's why we try to continually reach back into the history of the field and point out aspects of what we're doing here, how it has its roots in, in other places. Same thing with the argument that Bill's making. So I, I think being appropriately humble, showing professional humility is is an important step in in that direction. And I can see why why people might say, okay, well, if you call, if you're putting a label like compassionate on this, does is logically speaking, does it therefore mean anything? Not that is not compassionate. And I would say no, that's not what I'm trying to do. And, but I am trying to draw somewhat of a dis, of a distinction. I do believe that it's probably a good thing that some of us feel a little uncomfortable from time to time and get challenged to to learn about something new. The example I like to bring up here is, you know, the, during those terrible times of the pandemic, COVID pandemic, and the CDC would come out with this recommendation, and then a little while later they come out with the other and then another, and it, it was changing, but they were they were making a lot of changes based upon their evolving understanding of the virus and what's available to help protect people. So I would hear things like, Oh, they don't, they keep changing their mind. They don't know what they're doing. And I'm looking at this as a, as a good thing. This is science doing its job. And when there's evidence to suggest doing something a little differently to, to having, to being brave enough to take some of those steps. Let's see. Okay. The, the, the part about under the right circumstances that, that you mentioned with escape extinction and, and Tim Vollmer's interview. It's so very important. The context is is so very important. We have a lot of tools in the tool bag. Knowing which tool to bring out first is is a, an important skill. And I don't think we all know how to do that. I think a lot of times coming out of graduate school, we're enamored with the, these shiny, bright tools that we have from procedures. We we just spend a lot of money on learning how to do them and and oftentimes it seems like people are just going to the toolbox without first asking themselves, can, is there a lesser intrusive method that I could use? Is there one that has more televisability? Is there one that's a little less risky? So in that example of the escape extinction, I would imagine all those other lesser intrusive methods of teaching feeding would have been exhausted before they're getting into, you know, that level. You know, and I don't and, think, and, uh, well, let me just jump in here and say too, before people like inappropriately, you know, take these messages and do something, you know, you know, unwise with them or whatever. Yeah. As I, anytime feeding comes up, I am so not in the, that is so far a field of my scope of expertise, yeah. scope of competence or whatever. Is, and uh, anytime the feeding comes up and I was the one who brought it up. So I feel I should say this is that, don't do anything relative to feeding based off of what you hear on this podcast. This is not clinical advice. So don't say, I heard on the behavioral observations podcast that we could do escape extinction with no, no, no. Don't do not do that. If you don't know what you're doing with feeding, if you really, really aren't an expert in that area, yeah. find mentorship, find hire a consultant to walk you through it who really knows their stuff. 
So I'm sorry. I just had to put that PSA out there. I got kind of, you know, want to make sure. So it's important. It's very this, important. This platform, you know, I, I feel a responsibility in some regards that, you know, yeah. someone thinking they're, they're, they're running off doing the right thing and, you know, they might not have the necessary training or support or whatever. And they, you know, I don't want anyone to do anything harmful. So exactly, exactly. So that brings it home that really, I'm so glad you took the moment to do that because that sets me up to say this. Knowing what tool to pull out of the tool bag is important, and we need to lead with our values. We have to make values first decisions, not procedure first decisions. Okay, I think far too often newly minted grad students are very eager to try out their new procedures, and and they might re be reaching into that tool bag before checking to see if the values of safety, dignity, televisability, and steady, peaceful progress are, are checked off first? Or to what extent can this procedure help maintain those values? So, yeah, I guess to tie it back, we, we kind of stirred things up a little bit on purpose when we wrote that first trauma paper, because trauma was not being talked about in behavior analytic circles to the extent that we thought that it should be. And, it, and we run in circles that have overlap with occupational therapists, speech therapists, physical therapists, social workers, and they were all they were all talking about trauma and the effects of trauma and so forth. So I think behavior analysis was a little late to come to that game. And we, in that paper, talk about, in the Raja Raman paper, we, we talk about why we may be late to the game why historically we're late, you know, and basically make the case we can't be afraid of certain fuzzy terms. We can come to terms on, on how to define them in a way that still is conceptually systematic with our science. <laughs> I tell you what, the, a couple of years ago, we published a paper with, with an Italian group of clinicians and authors. The, the lead author is Iovino Luigi. Iovino, and I think it's a 2022, 2022, and it's the it's the first publication of a performance based DISCA, and in it we talk about this this thing called HRE, <laughs> which threw the, the reviewers for a bit of a loop the first round, but eventually we got it through, and I'm grateful for the work that they did on that paper because in the end they shined it up and it's a, it's a stronger product now. <laughs> um, yeah, got it. Got but, it. but to just lead a little bit, maybe a little teaser. Uh, everybody knows Celia Heyman, Doctor Celia Heyman. By yes, the way. yes, responsible for bringing probably hundreds of BCBAs over the finish line, and with the, the the ABA study group, and just you know, tireless cheerleader for all things behavior analysis. So that's right. And I've had the fortune of working with her for the last five years. And because she has many, many different jobs and wears different hats. And I admire her skill and her drive, and she's fabulous. So when she asked me to do something, I have a hard time saying no. And it's like two and a half years ago now, I think I think it's two and a half years, BAP came out with a, a call for papers for a special issue of compassion and behavior analysis. And she says, she says, Tony, you guys have to write a paper on this. And I was like, oh, I'm so busy right now. I don't have time for another paper. <laughs> and, but Celia was encouraging. I brought it to our team and our team thought it was important. So we, we did, we did write it and it went through a couple of rounds of, of editing. We're very grateful for those editors as well. They strengthened the paper on compassion and behavior analysis when we're treating severe problem behavior. My colleague, Dr. Mashid Gayamagami is the lead author, and she's done the lion's share of, of the writing and, and a lot of the conceptual work. I think we kind of all came together and she'd go back and, and, and bang it out. But thankfully, the paper's now been accepted. The last round was accepted pending revisions. We made the revision, so I expect that sometime in the near future, you're going to see, see that paper come on the scene. Very cool. Very cool. All right, Tony, I've kept you way over the time that I promised we would uh, take for this. So I am very thankful that you're able to stick around and 
and, and explore these these uh, really important topics here. So Thank you. I want to give the opportunity if there's anything else relative to PFA, SBT, or whatnot that we haven't covered already. I'm going to give you the opportunity mm-hmm. to let the audience know. But if not, let's just wrap up and curious what advice you might have for the newly minted BCBA. Yeah, for the mo- newly minted BCBA, I would say appreciate your appreciate our ha- our past, our history, know our history because it's important to understand where where we are, where we were relative to where we are now. So I say respect the history, but don't be dogmatic. And when the science tells us that it's time and it's okay to move forward in a way that may be at odds with your te- your very own teachers or some very out- the pillars of the scientific community, when the data says it's okay to do that, when there's evidence suggesting that's the way to go, don't be afraid to take the step. It's it's science. That's how science moves forward. It's slow. It's in part slow because everybody is very cautious and skeptical, and that's a built-in feature of the process. But ultimately, the world is going to continue to change. We need to be willing and ready to change with it. And with that will come new technologies, and they'll need to be investigated. So to put a little bow on it for the newly minted, be respectful, be brave, and and let science guide the way. All right. Can't think of better words to end on. Dr. Tony Camilleri, uh, thanks for joining me today. Best of luck with your new professional endeavors. And I look forward to seeing you at the Stone Soup 2024 conference. Thanks so much, Matt. It was was a real pleasure to be on. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Tony. And uh, huge thanks to the people at the Stone Soup conference for sponsoring this episode. Also, check out the CEUs at behavioralobservations.com and thebehavioraltoolbox.com. And last but not least, if you've made it all the way through and you enjoyed this episode, I'll make a, a small ask here. You know, what I'd like you to do, if you're so inclined, is to share this episode with your friends and colleagues, either through email or maybe sharing it on social media, word of mouth. All forms of sharing are accepted here at Behavioral Observations. And one last thing is that if you do have an opportunity to do a rating and review on the uh, podcast platform of your choice, I would be grateful for that also. All those things help. So thank you for supporting the show in all the ways that you do, even if it's just being a steady listener. I appreciate the time that people invest in this podcast. All right, that's it. I'll see you in session 277. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.